Hey everyone, Pushing Up Roses here, and welcome back to another Goosebumps video. I had taken a small break from discussing children's horror over the holidays and didn't have anything planned until I got an intriguing tweet. It read, Hey Pushing Up Roses, if you ever want to talk about the worst episode of Goosebumps, I got to nominate Attack of the Mutant. Now let me just say, if it isn't obvious to you already, I love horror for young adults. Despite the targeted demographic for shows like Goosebumps, I think there's a lot of inspiration to take away from watching and reading children's horror. Because there are certain restrictions set in place for this age group, the writer is challenged with developing something scary enough to please the young audience and not so scary that you're completely traumatizing them. Though sometimes I think these authors get a kick out of scaring the crap out of little kids. Look at this shit. I think setting these limitations open the doors for a lot of creativity. There's really a sizable overlap between the content you see or read in children's horror and what you see in adult horror, which is perhaps why older people still find entertainment in scary shows for adolescents. As an example, clowns! Clowns are everywhere to varying degrees of terrifying. Here's one in Are You Afraid of the Dark, intended for kids 7 and up, and for adults we get It, or Killer Clowns from Outer Space if you prefer something a little campier. There's a recent show called Creeped Out that is also made for young adults that sometimes resembles Black Mirror. They both tell cautionary tales, many of which feature technology. I would say in some ways I liked Creeped Out better, but the point remains. As an adult, there's still enjoyment to be had with children's horror for many reasons. R.L. Stein once said, when I write for kids, I have to make sure they know what can't happen. They have to know it's a fantasy. When I write for adults, they have to think it's real. Every detail has to be real or they won't buy it. For the most part, this statement reflects the content in his Goosebumps series. Ridiculous, unrealistic bad guys and monsters such as evil dummies, parents that turn into plants, possessed Halloween masks, everything is rooted in fantasy. There's no focus on weird serial killers or some greater evil. He really does take the mundane and twist it into something scary, and for the most part, I think it's successful. I like these books and the television series. I think they're fun and creepy and a staple of many people's childhoods, but you can't have this many stories, this many episodes, and not have a few duds. And my friends, Attack of the Mutant is a dud. I almost wanted to write a script doctor video on this because I was so shocked at the levels of failure this episode reached. It's a two-parter, and trust me when I say, it should not be. There is nothing less exciting than a story that drags out for 45 minutes straight. Let's take a look at the episode first, then I'll discuss where it went wrong. As we begin the episode, we're shown panels of a frankly ugly comic with voiceover for each of the characters. The galloping gazelle, the hero, and the masked mutant, a shape-shifting villain. I'll try not to leave any squid marks. Did he just say squid marks? Oh my god, he did. Owner of the comic is Skipper Matthews, hyper fan of the Masked Mutant series. His mom comes in and warns him that his father won't be pleased to see him reading comics after school, but she doesn't quite have the gumption to discipline him. Just let me finish it, okay? Well, um... No reading comic books till all your homework is finished. Why do you think his grades are so poor? Yeah. Because... I am a horrible father. So we have the passive, naive mom and a Crispin Glover dad. Fun. Suddenly, the comic book shows signs of movement. Take on me. The next day, Skipper meets with his school friend Wilson, attempting to share his love for the masked mutant, but Wilson doesn't seem to be interested because he's too busy looking at rocks while rocking this Table of the Elements shirt. Could they be going for a nerd character? Well, maybe he has a really deep, interesting reason for collecting rocks. After all, he's in the rock club. Why do you collect rocks anyway? I don't know. They're easy to find. No matter where you are, you're always near a rock. Oh, okay, so it's more like, yeah, I collect rocks because whatever. The masked mutant, now somehow freed from the confines of his comic book, decides to follow Skipper as he takes a bus to an orthodontist appointment. He meets a young girl named Libby who asks him if he goes to Franklin Junior High. Huh? Me? I wasn't talking to the empty seat. I was talking to your comic book. She expresses that she also collects comics, then they get into a brief conflict where they discuss who has better taste. Libby likes goofy comics and Skipper likes action heroes. Skipper decides his tastes are better. Nah, I'm the coolest. He realizes he misses his stop and just decides to get off the bus in some random location. <laughs> the bus has the Goosebumps logo on it. Not the cleverest Easter egg I've ever seen. Also, after we see the logo, the camera cuts right to some trash, so take that however you will. A few steps off the bus and Skipper sees... Um... Well, it's... 
It's... It's a rocket ship! It's a rocket ship! This is the mutant's headquarters, as shown earlier in the comic Skipper was reading. This looks cheap. We get a small glance at the mutant who suspiciously looks like the Tick. That night, Skipper attempts to tell Wilson what he saw, but his friend is skeptical. He tells him he probably just saw a set or something, because clearly Mutant HQ is not a thing. Wait. Wait, wait a minute. Wilson looks and acts somewhat like Skipper's dad. Earlier, Skipper's dad clearly dodged a kiss from the mom and look! Look! She's reading forbidden fantasies. <laughs> the plot is all clear to me now. Dad had an affair with Wilson's mom because Skipper's mom is checked out of the marriage, which is why she needs to fill the hole in her heart with cheap smut. And Skipper doesn't look anything like his parents, so his mom is also having an affair inspired by said cheap smut. Does Skipper know? Are the comics his escape? Strange. Dad comes in and scolds his son for reading comic books again and tells him it's time for bed. Skipper, of course, does not go to bed. He stays up under the covers reading the latest issue of The Masked Mutant. Ah, squid marks! The next day, Skipper attempts to find the building, but it's gone. Defeated, he goes home where he has mail waiting for him, a special edition comic. Skipper tells Wilson that the comic is trying to guide him because it's predicting what's happening. He's now convinced the building is behind an invisibility shield. Wilson is like, yeah, whatever, I still like rocks. Later that evening, Skipper returns and Libby joins him. She decides to humor him and attempt to pass through the invisibility shield, and it works. All right, time to see what this place looks like. Wow. This looks really cheap. The effects here are pretty abysmal. I tried to take the year and limitations of technology into account, but it just isn't cutting it. The garish colors of the building, on top of the holy sounding organ playing in the background, is considerably not scary. Welcome to Clown Church. We will begin mass shortly. The next chunk of this episode moves very slowly, so let's speed it up. The elevator malfunctions and they can't get back up to the exit. They explore more. Libby disappears. Skipper finds a room where comics are being flushed out. He finds a sketch of what appears to be him, but you can't convince me that is not Bobby Hill. It's me. Dude, no, it looks nothing like you. He also finds a questionable drawing of the galloping gazelle. He turns around, sees the mutant, and... <laughs> Now let's gallop into part two. Get it? Because galloping gazelle. <laughs> Turns out Libby was trying to scare him with a cardboard cutout. What? What the hell is happening? They manage to find another way out, and that evening at dinner, Skipper realizes he feels kind of grody and can't focus. He seems to have this weird comic book vision, though to be honest, I would probably also zone out if I had parents with the personalities of wilted lettuce. Don't worry, I'm sure Wilson can explain this entire situation with more logic. If you're going nuts, he says as he scrutinizes a rock. The comic vision gets even worse, causing Skipper to sweat and feel fatigued. Another new edition of the comic comes in and it documents his exploration of the headquarters and shows the galloping gazelle about to eat it. Seems that only Skipper can save him and his parents are too busy trying to distract themselves from their unpleasant marriage to listen to their son's concerns. So he hops the bus again and enters the now fluorescent building. Skipper goes into the basement and finds... Adam West? What took you so long? Don't you know you have to help me save the world? Adam West's career is just so, so bizarre. He tells Skipper to quickly untie him, so of course he takes 500 years to do it. While that's happening, the Galloping Gazelle urges him to use his powers because he's the kid who's supposed to help defeat the Masked Mutant. Skipper's like, but it's not me. I don't have superhero powers. And Gazelle is like, whatever, you're here, so let's do this thing anyway. Now get your butt up these stairs. They find the main control room where they wait for their foe. Unfortunately, he was there the whole time in the form of... A chair with snakes for armrests. Now this is nightmare fuel. Remember how Arl Stein said it's important that kids know when something is fantasy? This definitely fits that description, a mutant chair snake. The galloping gazelle starts whirling around, but it's not very effective and he just kind of gives up and leaves. He's right, I'm too old for this superhero stuff. You're on your own, kid. I'm not sure why he's allowed to leave and Skipper isn't. Libby comes in and talks to Skipper briefly before admitting that she was the masked mutant all along. Libby, that's not funny. There is no Libby. This is very Matrix. He then starts monologuing about how he needs more characters to fight and how hard it is to find a decent foe these days, so he disguised himself as Libby to test Skipper on his knowledge of the comic. If he knew enough, he'd be the right kid to work into the series. As he babbles on, I just keep thinking, 
Is he lonely? Does he just like need a friend or something? He also tells Skipper that he is now made of ink because when he entered the building, it scanned him into the comic. All right. In an act of desperation, Skipper tries to outwit him by saying he's not the boy he thinks he is. He's actually Elastic Boy and he needs to get back to his own comic. The mutant seems to buy it, but still wants to kill him with his... Um, Skipper says there's only one way to kill Elastic Boy, and that's with sulfuric acid. The mutant starts to shapeshift, but apparently, once he shapeshifts into a liquid, he just dies. I don't know why. This wasn't said before. It's just part of the comic book lore. Skipper escapes, but he still feels weird. It's because he is now Elastic Boy! <laughs> Right, let's dive into what I think went wrong with this episode because I agree that it's not on par with a lot of the others in the Goosebumps series and it definitely doesn't hold up to other children's horror shows that were out at the same time. One of the biggest issues I had with the storytelling is that nothing tied together. The episode would introduce us to all of these components and usually in children's horror you get some foreshadowing early on to what the character is going to do later. When they kept showing Wilson and his weird fascination with rocks, I was thinking maybe rocks would re-enter the equation since he goes out of his way to tell Skipper how amazing they are. Wilson never comes back though, every scene with him just kind of feels like padding. And along the same line, we also see this recurring comics will rot your brain saying, One day you're saying things, this stuff will rot your mind. It felt like the episode was going to go somewhere with that, as though these creepy characters knew something about the comic book world or Skipper himself. You gotta be careful with those things. They can warp your mind. Near the end, the bus driver looks at Skipper so intently, as though he knew comics could literally warp your brain, thus the comic vision Skipper was experiencing earlier. It felt like the story was going to have some interesting twist or moral about how if you read too many comics, you become one. Or maybe everyone was living in a comic the entire time and Skipper is the only one who sees it. Maybe Skipper isn't supposed to know he's a comic book character and the bus driver is aggressively warning him to rethink what he's doing. But again, these ideas don't go anywhere. It's hard to suspend your disbelief for a story like this. I kept asking things like, where's the author of the comic book? They mention him, but what's his role in this? And how does comic book vision really work? I kept thinking of a million twists that could make more sense. I thought maybe the author was evil and he could trap people in his comics. That could lead to a lot of scarier ideas. There's actually an episode of The Haunting Hour, a show for young adults also conceived by R.L. Stein, that also tackles a comic book plotline and it does it really well. Everything had a solid point, there was foreshadowing, ominous ideas, the threat of danger and suspense, and most importantly, it addressed the main character's behaviors and why things were happening. I know it can be tempting to dumb down things for a younger audience, and it's okay if the concept is simple, it just needs to be clear. I know that not all of the Goosebumps episodes are considered scary, especially to older fans, but I do think they do a good job at body horror, being relatively creepy, and bringing in strange characters. Something R.L. Stein does to stick to his kids need to know this is a fantasy mantra is write bizarre parental figures. They are usually eccentric or dismissive, and there is usually a reason for that, but these characters are just… irritating? Stein doesn't necessarily write bad parents, just strange and sometimes oblivious ones, and now that I told you that, you'll see it again and again in children's horror. These characters are actually rather boring, which is why I kept writing my own plotline where the mom has an affair with the neighbor. There's always a certain level of camp in Goosebumps, and for some reason, this didn't reach that level. Again, let's compare this to something similar. The Ghastly Grinner, an episode of Are You Afraid of the Dark that also focuses on a comic book character. It's a goofy episode, but it's consistently goofy with weird transitions, silly jokes, and an over-the-top villain. And plot-wise, it's easy to follow. It's memorable with its visuals, with the weird blue goop coming out of people's mouths, and the Grinner himself. I'm not saying it's a masterpiece, but it is cohesive. And maybe the biggest reason this didn't work is the tone and pacing. It's not scary. The villain takes on the characteristics of a cheesy, kind of old-school superhero. Everything is cartoony in a way that clashes with Skipper's obvious fear and anxiety. A lot of the first episode just features him and Libby walking around, and it goes on and on until the tension is totally sucked out of the room. When you're writing suspense, the timing is so important. If you keep your audience waiting for too long, they're just gonna get annoyed. I couldn't believe 
how long some of these scenes went, which is why I think they could have kept this to one part. I do wonder how different the episode is from the book, especially in tone. The ending is very different. Skipper doesn't turn into Elastic Boy in the book. He cuts his finger and bleeds ink, making him realize he is a character. I like that ending a little bit better because this isn't doing it for me. Stretch it! Stretch it is not even a clever tagline. Why not stretchin in place of bitchin? That would have at least been clever in that punny, childlike way Arl Stein seems to enjoy. After all, they made skid marks squid marks, so if you're gonna go with puns, go all in. This is definitely one of my harsher reviews on the Goosebumps series, but I do think it's important to talk about what makes children's horror good and where mistakes can happen. It could be that the book is solid and this was just a poor translation, and I'm prone to believe that's the case because this pacing seems to be an issue with the episode. Probably doesn't help to have Adam West, he just brings that silliness up to another level. There's a snake in my face! I hope you enjoyed this breakdown of Attack of the Mutant. If there is an episode you'd like to see me cover, good or bad, then let me know in the comments. I do consider your suggestions. Until then, stay spooky. Hey everyone, thanks for watching my video on Attack of the Mutant. If you liked this one, I have more Goosebumps related content, but first, you know what's really scary? Being broke! But thanks to the help of my patrons who donate small amounts of money in exchange for my efforts and a few rewards, I am way less broke! If you want to support the show, please consider becoming a patron, and if you can't, I would still love a like or a share. If you would like to see more of my videos, subscribing is a good option. Here's a few more in the same vein as the one you just watched. On the left we have a Goosebumps video, and on the right we have an Are You Afraid of the Dark video. See, even my outros are more consistent than Attack of the Mutant. Thanks again, and as always, I'll see you in the next one.